Hi guys, this is Meg Tudor Berry and welcome to my channel. In today's video, we're going to be discussing cardiac function curves. So let's get started. Let's look at the first curve that we have. Let's look at what the y and x axes are. So on the x axis, we have right atrial pressure or venous pressure. On the y axis, we have our venous return or cardiac output. Okay, so let's just talk about what these terms mean. Remember, venous return is the blood entering the heart, right? How much blood is coming in from the venous side of the heart, uh, from, from the venous side of the vessels back to the heart, okay? And venous return is directly related to cardiac output because how much comes in is what goes out, right? And if you increase venous return, and we'll write this here, if you increase venous return, you're increasing your preload and you're increasing your stroke volume, right? So cardiac output, if you remember the formula for cardiac output, it's heart rate times stroke volume. So if stroke volume increases, cardiac output increases. And it should make sense. If more blood's coming back to the heart, more blood is getting out, okay? Um, so those can be used interchangeably for this, um, the first curve that we're looking at, venous return and cardiac output. And like we said, on the x-axis is venous pressure or right atrial pressure. Um, so if more blood is coming back into this right atrium, right atrial pressure would increase. Okay. So if venous return increases, right atrial pressure increases. Okay. So um, keeping that in mind, let's look at this graph here. So if my venous return increases, then I start, so this is normal here. This change this this is our normal curve okay if venous return increases it starts out here okay so if venous return increases and let's follow that my right atrial pressure also goes up from about seven to about nine okay so venous return increases right atrial pressure increases so what are some reasons why you would see this increase and they're written right here for you so either volume loading so either you um, increased blood volume um, or you know there was a blood transfusion for example that's how they like to ask questions so there was a blood transfusion and more blood is now coming back to the heart or there's venoconstriction Okay, venoconstriction, if these veins constrict, they will push more blood to the heart, okay? And when we push more blood to the heart, venous return increases, right? So the more the venous system is constricted, the more blood it's pushing out to the heart, okay? So those are the two reasons why I would see um, higher venous return and eventually higher uh, venous pressure or right atrial pressure. The contrary to this would be if someone's bleeding, so like hemorrhage, right? So let's say you have volume depletion going on or you're venodilating. The venous system is dilating. It's becoming more compliant. So when the veins dilate, they become more compliant and they start holding on to the blood. So when they hold, start holding on to the blood, less blood is going back to the heart, okay? So more compliance means less venous return. They're sending less to the heart. And that's when we see this curve here. So low venous return, that means a low right atrial pressure comes down to about five, okay? So hopefully that first graph makes sense. Um, let's move on to the second graph. The second graph, we talk about arteriolar dilation or arteriolar constriction. So we're not interested in the venous side. We're not interested in venous return, right? And we're only interested, so we're not interested in this side anymore. We're only interested in these arteries on this side, okay? Now the arteriolar side doesn't really affect how much blood comes back to the heart. That is more controlled by the venous side. And that's why you're gonna see that no matter what happens to the arteries, our right atrial pressure or the venous pressure is going to stay constant, okay? So it stays at seven, regardless of arterial dilation or constriction. But what do we see change with arterial dilation and constriction? And for that, we have to again go back to the y-axis, look at the cardiac output, right? 
So if I'm pushing more blood out, if cardiac output increases from normal, so this was normal, you increase cardiac output. When cardiac output increases, you're pushing more blood into the arteries. The arteries would dilate, they would get bigger to accept all that blood coming from the heart. Okay, so the more blood the heart pushes out, the artery is going to dilate to accept all that blood. And that's why you see cardiac output increases, right atrial pressure doesn't change, and this is associated with arteriolar dilation. Okay, when the cardiac output increases, the arteries dilate. Contrary to this, if you're not pushing enough blood, if you're only pushing less blood out of the heart, if cardiac output decreases, which is here, we would see an associated arteriolar constriction. Okay, the arteries will constrict and they do that to maintain blood pressure, right? So arteries will constrict in response to low blood coming from the heart. But again, this would have no, um, this would make no difference on the right atrial pressure or the, or the venous pressure. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. And this is our last graph and then we're going to piece it all together and they're gonna, we're going to do some practice questions. Okay, so remember cardiac output. What did we say? Cardiac output is stroke volume times heart rate. We talked about stroke volume in our first graph, right? Which had to do with venous return. But cardiac output is also dependent on the heart rate or the contractility or the chronotropy of the heart, okay? And when we, how do we look at that? We're gonna use this third curve. This is normal. If we increase the contractility or increase heart rate, we go up on the graph. And this is what we see when we increase contractility, okay? If we decrease contractility, we go down on the graph, okay? So these curves that you see are the ones that um, are representing changes in heart rate or contractility, okay? So now we're gonna put all of this together into this one giant graph okay and there's a bunch of lines here but it's just all the three graphs that we've seen so far just put all together into one big graph so let's look at it okay so the first one is blood transfusion so you start from that red star in the middle okay so blood transfusion what's happening when you're in blood get stop transfusing blood you're increasing blood volume and when you increase blood volume, remember it impacts your venous return. So anytime you have an increase in volume, and we can go back to show you here. So when, you, when there's volume loading, you go up on the venous return graph, okay? So we're gonna go, we're gonna pick this graph up here. We're gonna start from our little star and we're gonna go up to point F. The contractility hasn't changed, so we're still on the normal contractility. We're not gonna go up or down. Uh, we're gonna stay on the blue line, uh, but we will move to point F, and the answer for this one is F. Okay, let's look at the next one. Let's look at uncompensated hemorrhage. What happens when you lose a lot of blood is absolutely the opposite of blood transfusion, right? Uh, your volume depleting so you would go down to this curve here and your answer would be point I okay next one you would administer someone with a beta 1 blocker beta 1 blocker does it increase or decrease contractility it slows the heart down right it decreases contractility decreases heart rate so we'll start from here, and this is the curve that we're selecting for ourselves, going down to the red one, and our answer is L. Oh, sorry about that. Okay, fourth is administration of nitroglycerine. Nitroglycerine uh, veno dilates, okay? When the veins dilate, they become more compliant, they start holding on to more blood, so they decrease the venous return. So what's the graph associated with decreased venous return? It's this guy here. And again, our answer would be I. Okay, one more. If we lose blood volume, 
but we increase contractility. So there's two things going on here. You're losing blood volume, but you're increasing the contractility. So for the loss of blood volume, you would go down to this graph here. We talked about that in uncompensated hemorrhage, but you're increasing contractility. So first you're gonna to come to point I, but now we have to go up or down to point E or H, depending on what's what's happening with our contractility. So we're increasing contractility. So I would go up to point E, and that would be my answer. Okay, so it's a combined um, blood volume loss and increased contractility. I always like to move um, on my. Um, I always like to move on these lines first and then just go up and down, simply go up and down uh, according to the contractility. Okay, so last one. Arteriolar vasodilation with a beta-1 blocker. So arteriolar vasodilation, when would we see that? When there's more cardiac output or less cardiac output? We would see that when there's more cardiac output because when we're pushing more blood into the arteries, the arteries would have to vasodilate. To hold, to hold on to all the blood that's being sent by the heart. So this, when you have increased cardiac output, you see arteriolar vasodilation. So this is the curve that we're selecting right now. So we're gonna go up to point G. However, we're not gonna stop there because we see that we administer uh, a beta one blocker. So when, we, when you administer a beta one blocker, you're gonna go down on this line. So your answer would be point K. Okay, it's actually pretty fun going up and down these lines. Always um, try to do the contractility up and down second and work with the other stuff first. It usually helps me, um, you know, move more easily on this graph. Um, and I hope this helps. Thank you.